Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thanks to Zai that we can bring you this extra content today as part two of this fantastic episode with Art Kleiner. We've broken in over a couple of weeks, both to give ourselves spacing effects for the content to be able to sit in for ourselves, but also give me time to read this magnificent book behind me. Zai is a global financial services company specializing in foreign exchange and payments and supporting innovation in all its forms, including this show. Check them out on HelloZai.com. Let's get into today's content. Art, happy Christmas. I hope you had a great one. Welcome back to the show. It's great to be back. Uh, same thing to you. Happy holidays of all sorts. And we're heading right into the new year. We said we'd come back and we'd cover Pelagians, NTLs, T groups. We also said we'd cover neuroscience. We're not going to get to that today. What Art and I have agreed is because the book is so dense with information, we're going to come back and we're going to do a series. So we're going to cover a couple of chapters at a time if we even can. If not, we'll just do one chapter and really let the idea sink in. So I'm going to jump to the idea of Pelagians. And here again, just to remind you the way Art writes the book is he introduces a, a religious group of some sort to kind of give a metaphor or a lens through which to see that chapter. And there's a heretic in each of those groups, and the heretic has committed a, a heresy. So I'm going to start here with the way Art starts that chapter. So the chapter is called the Pelagians. And the subtitle is the National Training Laboratories 1947 to 1962. And the heresy is people are basically tr trustworthy. You cannot understand a system unless you try to change it. People can rise to fill their highest potential and small groups hold the key to beneficial change. And I'm going to tee you up here, Art, with a beautiful quote about a heretic with the intro that goes as follows. He attacked the nonsensical idea, as he called it, that Adam's sin had been transmitted to the rest of humanity. He argued that people were perfectible, that human actions and human will guided by God could create a kind of echo of heaven on earth. This is the story of Pelagius, and of course, Augustine of Hippo, the antithesis of this heretic. Whoa. And so we're starting right at what is probably the deepest question about human nature, which is, is it inherently, which is in the foreground, human virtue or human sin? And when I say sin, I mean the propensity of people to do the wrong thing, whether it's our intention or not. And when I say human virtue, I mean the propensity of humans to act on behalf of something nobler in ourselves and beyond ourselves, again, whether it's intentional or not. And this was a matter of great debate in the early part of, uh, you know, the Christian and the early history of the Christian religion. And I'm going to just give you, Aiden, I'm going to give you a blanket disclaimer, which is that I don't really know what I'm talking about when I talk about religious history. In other words, I'm like many writers, I'm an amateur at this and I'm coming in, you know, like all writers of any sort. I'm selecting the things that agree with what I want to believe. So I'm going to at least be upfront, which is that I want to believe in human virtue. But I also want to write everything I write in a way that those who believe in human wickedness would recognize that I'm talking about reality. I want it all. And I think that's what many of the people involved in organizational change and you know, management in its best sense, that's what they also wanted. They knew that they were, and you know, it's, it's also a big part of our political history in, um, in uh, you know, the English tradition going back to the Magna Carta and probably before then in the United States tradition um, and in many um, indigenous traditions. You know, we want to set up structures that allow for the fact that people are not going to be perfect. And yet we also want to ennoble people and give people the opportunity to do great things in all senses of the word great. And, Corporations are built around that. And honestly, one of the big questions right now in business is how virtuous do we have to require people to be 
in order to really tap their commitment and entrepreneurial spirit. So it matters, right? If, if what we do in the world happens through large organizations and large organizations can only do great things if they tap people to be great, then how do we, how do, what do we expect these organizations to do in order to tap that power and that awareness? And what do we expect from our people? You know, if you go to work for a company and you're inclined to cut corners, does that mean that the company should not hire you? Or if you're really innovative, you're always cutting some corner, you're always breaking some rule. So how do you know which are the rules to break and which are the rules not? And that is what the Pelagian versus uh, Augustinian debate was all about. Mm -hmm. Beautifully recapped art, and I, I want to connect it now for particularly those people who are interested in organizational change, HR directors, L&D directors, you'll love where the origins of group dynamics comes from. I'm going to tee you up with another beautiful quote here, Art, that will lead us into the origins of group dynamics. You said, in the years after World War II, businessmen were readier than anyone realized to be influenced by Pelagian imperative. It quelled the ache that people felt when the vernacular spirit was dormant. Even in the hardest driving, most authoritarian businesses, many managers wanted to believe that they could come to work, achieve the performance required by the numbers, and still feel welcomed and recognized as people. They wanted a chance to do something important beyond just making money. The promoters of this view didn't call it Pelagianism, they called it group dynamics and later they would call it organizational development, the human potential movement, and even organizational learning. Perhaps this will tee us up for the origin of T groups, and then we'll get into the NTLers as well. This is fascinating history. So one more broad bit of um, context. We're talking about a time, the world had come out of horrific depression, and horrific, um, you know, global war between extremely authoritarian states. And a number of things had happened. In the war, um, the, uh, in the war, women and people of color in the United States, other minorities and other places participated and often participated more as equals than they had in the previous histories of their countries. Also, a movement towards universal public education had been building since the turn of the century. And the Industrial Revolution itself gave people agency. So people felt like they had more choice than they ever had had before. They were, and many people who were in positions of responsibility in companies were people who had not necessarily come up through Harvard or Yale or, you know, very elite organizations, very elite colleges. They'd gone to state schools, they'd gotten technical degrees in engineering or whatever, and then they'd been promoted to management. And all of a sudden they had to work with people and they realized that their college education didn't count for anything. Um, there's a story in the Age of Heretics about a guy named Ed Dulworth who was very influenced by the movements we're going to talk about and who one day came into one of the plants where he worked and he saw that somebody had taped a guy up to <laughs> <laughs> i love this man <laughs> yeah they, they, they taped you know one of the co-workers uh, you know in a young a young kid basically a 19 year old or 20 or whatever he'd come in he really wanted to work hard he was energetic so his fellow co-workers taped him up to a uh, to a ladder or a pole, you know, uh, up at the top of the stairs and left him dangling there. And they found him, you know, when the morning shift started and he was working too fast. He was working too hard. And Dolworth realized this wasn't the fault of any of the people. It was the he wasn't ever going to understand how to deal with issues like this, how to change this kind of thing unless he talked to everybody. And unless he let every member of the team, regardless of whether they had a high school education, a college education, an elite education, whatever, unless he let them participate. And that, so there's a big line, and we'll come to that in NTL as well, uh, which is National Training Laboratories. There's a big line between 
this movement of people are basically good. And then, well, if people are basically good, where do you draw the line at who's included in people? You don't draw it anymore in terms of religious background because you don't draw it in terms of immigrant background. You don't draw it in terms of racial background. You don't turn it, draw it in terms of gender. And ultimately you don't draw it in terms of, um, you know, uh, predisposition of, uh, of uh, proclivity or, or how, you know, basically once you open the door to the idea that people have the capacity to do well, you're kind of stuck down a path of people means everybody. And that's where we've been going. So that's the broad picture. Uh, when I looked into this for the first time, and remember I had been, um, I'd been working for Stuart Brand at the Whole Earth Catalog, not too long before I started the book. And the big, the, the, the earth shaking phrase that went all the way back to the very first Whole Earth Catalog was we are as gods, we might as well get good at it. And I believed that. I, I still believe that, um, but it's a shocking phrase because, you know, the book of Genesis starts with the snake saying to Eve, you shall be as gods. That's how you eat the fruit of the, you know, that's why you're going to eat the fruit of the tree of uh, knowledge. And that's the beginning of the fall is this desire to be as gods. Now here comes Stuart and Stuart represents a whole group of people who are powerful they run turbines and they're changing the direction of water and they're, you know, building dams and they're powering up with electricity, the whole continent, the whole world. And they're sending people on trips across rail and then across automobiles and they're communicating across vast distances instantaneously, immense power. And the whole earth catalog said, we might as well get good at it. Right. So casual. There's no big fall. We might as you know, we're already there. We're already like gods. We'd better figure out that we know what we're doing. And if you believe that people are basically fallen and the only thing that can help them is faith in a power greater than oneself, you can hold that and the belief that um, we are as gods anyway, and we better get good at it. Those two things can fit together, but it's not always a comfortable fit. And that was the heart of disagreement between, in my view, in between Augustine and Pelagius, right? Around 350 AD, you know, a Carthagian monk and a, another monk who came down from Scotland. And they're basically disagreeing about how much discipline imposed upon people is necessary for virtue. So jump now to the 1930s. <laughs> and I just I just wanted to link it to something we mentioned in, in part one, which was we were talking about the origin of an over an over abundance of numbers and metrics that are uh, thrust upon people and therefore they live by those metrics. That story about Ed Dulworth and the essentially the, the new kid who signed up and was too eager to do his job. Many of our many of our listeners are are leaders of organizations of organizations of factories as well, and they will have seen this. And the difference is just today that this is done mentally. It's not the person's not physically tied up or physically bound, but they're mentally bound, and that's a that's an even worse torture in some cases. And to be insulted, according to some studies, carries the same level of pain as actually being attacked physically. So it's, you know, it, I don't think it actually does. I'd rather be insulted, but it takes a certain kind of fortitude to withstand either one. One of the things I love about where we're going now with the story is we're starting to look at, well, realities are created by thoughts, created by new information. And if you reassess that information, and go back and go, look, this is where it all came from. And it was from this burning desire almost like you said about about you are gods, the whole idea came to mind of Prometheus and the gift of fire for enlightenment to kindle the mind. 
And and this is where the origin of this is, is that well, if you kindle people's spirit, they'll actually become more effective and more purpose driven and do better work. And this was the origins of those days when we saw the origins origins of group dynamics and getting the most out of people and not getting it most out of them for the bottom line, but for life for to be godlike. To make wise use of their power, and to recognize that they had power, but they had power in groups. So imagine it's the 1930s, like the late 1930s. Europe is facing one invasion after another. Um, you know terrible things are going on there, but you don't know exactly what they are because the information is not really available yet as to how dire things are. But there are refugees and they're coming with stories. You, especially in the field of social science, because a lot of psychologists and social researchers are coming out of Germany and the occupied countries. You know that a war is coming, but you don't know when, or you guess that a war is coming. And there are big battles. And then also you, there's a depression that's been going on for, you know, by now more than six or seven years. And in the late thirties, it, it gets worse. It's sort of like where we are today vis-a-vis -vis COVID in January or December, January, you know, 2021, 2022. We know things could be getting better, but we don't know how. We know things could be getting worse and we don't know how much. And one thing we know is that the failures of human activity have caused a lot of our problems. So right now we know that failure to organize an effective response against COVID has exacerbated the progress of the disease. We know that better management would have made a difference. Regardless of who we accuse of bad management, we know, or where we play, lay the blame, we know that it could have been managed better. And we know that if we were living in the 30s, we know that, you know, highly aggressive, undemocratic regimes exist, may be gaining power, and are really threatening, and we don't know what's going to happen. And one of the scientists who came out of Germany during that time and came to the United States, a friend of Margaret Mead's, was Kurt Lewin, uh, L-E-W-I-N. He spoke mostly German when he got here. Looked a little bit like uh, the Marx Brothers without makeup, you know, kind of that same slender build, you know, kind of studied, intense eyes. Um, very kind and generous man, like many of the leaders of organizational change. And built very rapidly a community of people who studied with him, conducted experiments with him. And what he was interested in, sort of like Dewey before him, was the nature of human and organizational learning. So he conducted a lot of experiments to try to figure out what is it that induced people to change their behavior. And he had the idea that groups mattered. So before the 19, before World War II broke out in the late 30s, he set up, a, you know, there was this group called Boys Clubs, kind of like the Boy Scouts. And he set up this group where he had, he divided a group of, he, he got permission to experiment with a boys club, right? It's the kind of thing that wouldn't happen today, but he got it then. He divided the boys, maybe 20 in a group, so 60 kids all together into, and they're all like young teenagers, 12, 13, 14, that, that age. He divides them into subgroups. One group, he has the, uh, he, he, he has counselors, you know, club leaders, older people in their 20s, college students, browbait people, act really authoritarian, tell them what to do strictly. He had another group, the um, club leaders basically do whatever the kids say they want, you know, we, you, know, you know, not ignore them, but not give them any direction. And he has a third group act in a very participative way, give people 
ask the students, what do you really want to do here? And then come up with kind of constructive ways to help them get there. The first group turn into basically, you know, hellions. They pick fights, they try to boss each other around, they bully each other. The second group, they're doing okay, but they're kind of listless. I mean, it's exactly what you would expect. And then the third group, they start taking charge themselves. They not only, you know, they, it's like they now have the tools to do the things they want to do and they become more capable at it. One of Lewin's, um, one of Lewin's students running some of those groups was a man named Ron Lippett, who was at the University of Michigan. And the war comes and they come back from the war and they, uh, Lewin gathers together another experiment in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is a small city near where I live today. And I live in Connecticut. And it's a, it's always been a, well, I don't know always, but it, for a long time, it's been a racially mixed city, a very divided city, and a very poor city in terms of um, average income and, and a lot of people living in poverty. And there's a lot of black and white tension. And so they have, Lewin is invited to lead a group on race relations, 1946. It's a year after the war ends. And the people involved in the room are, you know, there's a lot of street crime, there's a lot of gangs. So there are people who work with gangs, there's police in the room, teachers, social workers, professionals, all of the educated professionals, they've, you know, we, we won a world war and now we're gonna come back and see what we can do in our own country. And they come in and they're having dialogues you know, people sitting, talking to each other about race relations. And every night, the social scientists come and meet after the regular group to sort of talk about who said what and what they might figure out and, you know, what conclusions they might draw. As, you know, social scientists do, you know, the other people are the lab and they're the experimenters. The other people are the mice running the races. And one day, you know, maybe, maybe the second day of the session, it's a four or five day session. So one day, one of the participants stumbles into the room uh, and sits down and listens to the social scientists talk. This is after hours. And they're all talking about what the people in the room were saying and what they meant and what they thought they meant. And at one point she says, well, don't you want to hear what I actually meant? And she, and she tells them and they start talking about it. And the next night, everybody comes into the room and then they just bring everybody into the room and they start talking about what the group does. And this is known as group dynamics. This is one of two places in the world where group dynamics is invented. The other is a psychological, social psychological institute in London called the Tavistock Institute which is a little more formal and is more associated with um, labor unions. And, and But this one, it's like academics come in and they forget their academics because what happens next is all the people, all the counselors in the room were graduate students, you know, studying psychology and social science. And they begin experimenting with group dynamics. Lewin is at the head of the group, he's the main faculty member. They begin to come up with theories about what works, you know, because they're seeing this really does change behavior. And they, and Lewin says, what we really need is an island far away from civilization where people can go on retreats. So they have a lead to a remote location in a town called Bethel in Maine, which is really up in, it's like if Maine is like a giant, you know, sort of dog's head, Bethel is like right in the top center. It's like in the eye of one of the dog's eyes. And um, and they go the there. Third and, eye, the third eye art. Yeah, it actually is kind of in the position of a third eye, if, if you think of Maine as a big head. Um, 
which is a stretch, but, and they have an old Victorian, they have access to an old Victorian house there. They rent the house and they start giving courses and they plan for a whole level of programs. And just as they're about to start, Kurt Lewin dies. He passes away suddenly, I think from a heart attack. And so it's a real kind of Moses story. He leads them up to the promised land and then they have to go there themselves. And the three people who kind of set it up and are in charge are Ron Lippett, that student from the University of Michigan who is now on the faculty and who later founds or maybe at the time found some of Michigan's tremendous uh, groups and institutes that do social science research. A guy named Ken Benny, who is like a sort of tough academic character, like you sometimes find, who is, um, I forget which college he's in even. Uh, and then um, and then Leland um, Bradford, who is this slight, unassuming, modest individual who goes on to lead the National Training Laboratories, which is what they called it for the next 30 years until the early 70s. And Great memory, by the way. <laughs> you to... well, when you write these things and then go over them, I, I probably made a couple of errors there. According to my notes, you're bang on. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stitch, give you an overlay to catch your breath and grab a coffee while I, I'll quote some of the, the passages I pulled that will paint in between the gaps here. There's some beautiful stuff here just for... Those people are really interested in how it was all coming together. So you said there at Bridgeport, they had invented a powerful new kind of conversation in which the flow of conversation is also the subject of the same conversation, and in which people's understandings of themselves and each other seem to flow naturally to the surface. It wasn't a therapy group. Its point was to understand social dynamics, not individ individual neuroses. Lewin, Lippitt, Bradford and Benny called a T group, T standing for training. Lewin suggested holding the T groups in a cultural island, like Art just said, far from anyone's homes or daily cares. So participants could in effect, enter into an isolated world together. I thought that was important Art. that particular point, I work in corporate training. And oftentimes, there's a bit of pushback when you go, you're better off getting off site. But this was the origin of the cultural island. And there's more here, I'll, I'll keep going. There was a line I particularly loved, making a significant alteration in an attitude or belief Lewin had said required three stages, an unfreezing process to get rid of the old outmoded beliefs unlearning essentially, a learning process to become familiar with the new idea, learning, and a refreezing process. So the new attitudes and practices would stick and take root. So crystallizing that new learning, the NTL people didn't quite understand how to refreeze, but T groups were clearly the most effective unfreezing device anyone had ever seen beautifully brought together their art. And I, I just find it so fascinating to go this, this was the origin of that, you know, I, I know the origin was probably right back to the, the, the Greek, you know, uh, the baths and the chats and the banks that everybody chatted to on the, the benches, etc. When we when this was part of our vernacular culture, and it's just faded this and when we're entering such a machine age, this human skill of connection of listening to each other and actually purposefully listening, giving each other the time pu putting aside the worries that are preoccupying us is so essential. It's always been essential, but it's just a skill that's atrophied somewhat. I think it's diffused. So we all have that skill more than a typical manager might have had it in 1951. But we don't have it to the extent that maybe we need it. Um, I'll add, you know, things like uh, Otto Scharmer's Theory U are basically um, that same concept brought to life today. And, and unfreezing is, and really what the 60s were about was for a lot of people how to unfreeze, you know, and, and we all, as we 
come into public life, if we have any sense of choice at all, we recognize that we have to unfreeze the, you know, the, the shackles of our own, of our own habitual thinking and practice. And that's, you know, and then, and increasingly we're trying to have companies be part of that, bring that together with our company. And I know that's part of your drive of your work art. And, and I think, you know, just, it's why, you know, your work resonates so strongly with me that I feel a connection in somewhat is that sharing this knowledge and helping people unfreeze is is a noble cause. And I think this is this way of, you know, the world has changed a lot. This is the way we can do that by connecting and sharing the ideas and it, and bringing not necessarily new information to the table, but information that has been back put on the back burner a little bit and uh, helping people unfreeze. Let's jump back then to 19. So we're now like 1951, 1952. And Aiden, I'll just say a lot of what I knew about this, there are really two people, myself and um, Marv Weisbord, who wrote about this time as historians. And both of us benefited enormously from knowing people who were there firsthand. I didn't know Douglas McGregor. I didn't know Leland Bradford, but I knew I met, I talked at length with his son, David, and I didn't talk with, I think I talked with Lippitt, but I, I'm not sure I talked with Benny, but I talked with lots and lots of the other people who were there. Um, Chris Argerus, Edgar Schein, uh, Edie Seashore and Charlie Seashore and um, Robert Blake and uh, Dick Beckhard and Kathy Dannemiller, quite a number of other people who were sort of part of the early history of OD. And it basically what you had is you had this island, this cultural island. Every summer, people from uh, on summer break from universities around the country, by invitation only, would gather there up in Maine for four to eight weeks. And it was like, you know, in some ways it was, well, it was like an academic uh, retreat, like a summer camp, but with a lot of, a lot of discovery, a lot of the things that we now think of as standard OD practice, for instance, started there, including the wall chart, the flip chart, which started basically because they were trying to sketch some of these patterns. Kurt Lewin used to have this egg-like pattern of all the forces that affected a person and how they moved, you know, people back and forth on in terms of what they were going to act. And it was either that or some other schematic diagram. They wanted some large plane on which to um, on which to build it. You know, this is in the very beginning days of computers. There was no such thing as an electric whiteboard that don't even think they had blackboards in any way they didn't want to erase them they didn't you know so they they went out to a butcher shop and they brought back these big rolls of butcher paper that was all they could find up in rural Bethel and they put it on the wall and that was the origin of the flip chart the the um erasable marker came later I guess and um and they would come up with models of human behavior. You know, basically a lot of, when you see people at work and you see the same kind of recurring behavior time after time, you begin to look for the patterns that influence them under the surface. So there was a lot of academics looking for academic patterns. One of the patterns they didn't see is that they were systematically reducing the contribution of women who were in the room. This was, I mean, there were, there may have been people of color there, but I didn't hear of any. Um, and, but there were lots of women there, but they were sort of relegated. They would be the ones who would work with the nonprofit groups or the wives, you know, the wives groups or that kind of thing. And they, and they very rarely worked with the leadership, you know, the CEOs. And gradually over the course of the fifties and sixties, it became more evident that innately women tended to have the skills that were part and parcel of effective work in this domain. And so they you know, gradually gained 
more and more positions of responsibility. And when I say gained, they took, you know, they, they, they qualified for and then took, but they were, it was always an uphill battle. And this becomes important later, it becomes important in the early 70s. A few things happen. One is some people, well, first of all, NTL became famous in academic circles. Um, Douglas McGregor, who was uh, the head of the of uh, Sloan School's, um, I want to say the organizational department, uh, organizational uh, aspect of it, but yeah, he may have been. I don't remember what his what his title was. He was very very senior and important at the Sloan School. He might have been at MIT. Um, he was a frequent guest. Yeah, he he was head of organizational studies department for MIT Sloan. Okay, which was one of the most significant departments there, and he was a regular visitor at um, at NTL during the summers, and worked closely with many of the faculty there. Um, Abraham Maslow was also uh, connected with many of the people there. Warren Bennis, who was one of the leaders of NTL. Uh, and wrote a, wrote a beautiful forward for your book. Wrote a forward for my book, uh, was instrumental in publishing the second edition, was kind of like a mentor to me in many ways, was one of the most active people at NTL, and he gave the eulogy at Maslow's funeral. So there was a huge connection between you know, the, this new wave of psychology uh, represented by Maslow and by uh, many of the luminaries. A lot of people were trained at, in, at NTL and went back into organizational psychology or social psychology. And around the early 60s, around 64, some of the people at NTL began to commercialize their work. You know, there's always this tension in organizational work between the, ac the pure academics and those who have to, you know, basically receive revenues for their work by consulting with companies or coaching. And both sides have loyalties that conflict with each other. And both sides have you know, attitudes under the surface. And some of this began to come to the surface when Robert Blake introduced the, um, the management grid, which essentially was an instrument by which groups could conduct their own T groups on themselves. They didn't need trainers. It was like an originally NTL in a box was how they called it. Train the trainer. Train the trainer. <laughs> it, it train the trainer package. And Many people at NTL felt like, you know, Blake was, and his collaborator, Jane Mouton, were stealing. You know, they were taking their intellectual property and making it generally available. Um, if you actually look at Blake's work, it was, it was very unique and distinctive and different from a lot of what else was at um, NTL. But the basic Pelagian principle was the same. People can be trained to manage their own groups. And this had to happen. This absolutely had to happen because there weren't enough trainers. You know? And the profession was not regulated in the same way that, you know, medicine or law would be regulated. Not that those are regulated well necessarily, but this profession was messing around with organizational dynamics in ways that really affected people. So, for example, there would be T groups after which people would commit suicide. There would be T groups in which people would break down and be ostracized from the company afterwards and have to resign. T groups were the groups that were called training groups, you know, because it was national training laboratories. The idea is you're training people to be more effective. But this is an infant practice. And, you know, as with every, every type of innovative work, there are overreaches and mistakes. And there was a whole other movement towards encounter groups that also left people vulnerable on the West Coast. That was more about healing yourself 
this work was not about healing yourself. They, some people called it therapy for normals, but it wasn't supposed to be therapy at all. It was just, as you said, Aiden, it's people trying to understand these invisible structures of intercommunication that occur whenever groups work together over time. And that usually don't get named because it's embarrassing to talk about <laughs> uh, how we talk, right? We don't want people to know how we talk. We don't ourselves are not aware of how we're confusing others or continually misunderstanding others or revealing our own biases or our own tendency to mansplain or be a Karen. You know, we have names for them now. We didn't have those <laughs> names then. But I, 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 I only about. learned of a Karen from my kids, by the way. I, I never... <laughs> Karen's a, a late enough development in society. Well, imagine that you're playing that role. You're complaining all the time about what other people do. Very virtuous. And you're a woman, a middle-aged woman in a group. They don't have the word Karen, but somebody's irritated enough with you to say, I haven't heard you say one nice thing about anybody else all year. Yeah, Karen. And it's really <laughs> destroying us. Okay, that is not going to have a healthy effect <laughs> on anybody. I just wanted to mention one thing because it, it, it ties in nicely and we won't get to it. it was um, the origin of the Johari window was here as well. It was in, it was in there somewhere. And that whole idea where you were saying the 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 damage where, where you had some of the suicides and and some of the mental breakdowns, we still get that in in organisations today. It, it's not as apparent because it's more of a hidden illness. And people, I I see this. I don't know if you've ever seen this art with. Uh, I think sometimes a three hundred and sixty on a team, like a diagnostic, can be quite dangerous because somebody who thinks they're a rock star all of a sudden realizes not many people are that fond of you and all of a sudden it damages them mentally. I've been on all sides of that dynamic. Um, I think a 360 is for many organizations, a way of whispering to themselves about themselves, about what matters here. It's how people learn what matters here, the subtle unspoken aspects of the culture. And if you don't fit and discover it through a 360, it can be very difficult for everybody. So that doesn't mean, I, I actually think 360s are, are good if they're done well, but there's a lot of research that shows that they can be really damaging. So around 1967-68, the bloom comes off the rose, you know, the honeymoon is over for tea groups. Corporations stop asking for them. They've had too many people break down. This is not the only reason they broke down, typically. I mean, it is the 60s. It is, um, but people are struggling. And people stop attending the classes. There are com there's competition. And the money runs out. And things get worse and worse and worse. And, you know, when an organization is declining and it's dependent on contributions and it suddenly declines, it's easy to think, well, we'll just get through the hump and then things will get better. But if they don't get better, you can really fall down a precipice. And that's a financial precipice. And that's what happened at NTL. They started using the money from next year's courses to pay this year's instructors, you know, things that they got bailed out by a couple of, um, of big donations and those didn't hold, they weren't big enough. Um, there was a whole thing where they tried to start a new university and that failed. So it's sort of like the failures built up and ultimately it fell apart. And it fell apart in, I wanna say 1972. And there was, and it would look like it was going to fall apart forever. But it was still the only place where you could definitively have a real grounding in the original principles of 
organizational development and in the current experimentation. So in that sense, it's like being in medicine and having the Mayo Clinic fall apart. Right? It's, and so there was a Hail Mary effort and L, uh, E.D. Seashore, Edith Seashore, who I interviewed and got to know pretty well, uh, and her husband, Charlie. Basically, Edie and three other people, Peter Vell, um, I want to say Elsie Brown, and another person whose name is in the book, basically took over they took over national training laboratories. And what they did in order to revive it is so was so controversial and controversial in the same way that a lot of what's going on now with diversity is controversial. They had a theory about what had to happen, which is basically if you want, they understood there had been protests at national training labs. So I'm going to start that over. They had a theory about what was wrong and it had to do with the gender and racial makeup of the faculty. If it continued to be dominated by white men, it wasn't that this was you know, a lack of equity. It was just simply that it would be seen as increasingly irrelevant because people coming into the workforce were increasingly people of color and women many of the issues facing organizational development had to do with diversity, especially for women. This was the first wave of women in the workforce in any quantity. And this was the future opportunity to gain a presence and earn income. So they saw it as a business imperative. But in order to take that seriously, it's a little bit like if you're a company now and you have to take climate change seriously. One of the first things you have to do is clean up your own emissions. So they decided to rip the Band-Aid off. At that time, National Training Laboratories had, I want to say something like 200 leaders, you know, sort of fellows who were the top group. And they had all been, they'd all risen through the academic ranks and been, you know, it's sort of like an academic thing. They'd all been elected by their fellows and, you know, initiated. They, the, the gang of four fired all of them, took away all their fellowships. And then they had these long meetings all through the night where they set up a rule for every, they had four cohorts, white men, white women, men of color and women of color. And for they may have used the word non-white or another word at that time, but that's what they meant. And for everyone admitted into one group, there had to be somebody in the other groups, which meant that there were a lot of white men who were not admitted back as fellows because you had to pass that test. You had to have three other people qualified. And so they ended up with a completely different cohort and group of people. And that became the basis of what we now call the diversity and inclusion practice. Beautiful. That was its beachhead. And that teases up nicely, Art, for the next day. We, thought, <laughs> we, we optimistically thought we'd get there today. We didn't even get through properly through uh, T groups and, L and TLers. But we want to introduce the idea where Ford wanted to introduce more diversity into its workforce as well. And uh, I mentioned that in episode one, I hoped we'd get to it in episode two, it'll probably be episode six by the time we get there. <laughs> if, if we're still ticking by then, I think that one we can actually do pretty quickly, because well, we basically, when you're going to change people, with a change of that magnitude? Do you start with the structures, the larger political and formal structures, or do you start with the hearts and minds? NTL started with the hearts and minds. Ford started with the structures. They changed training practices. 
and they change hiring practices. The problem is both sides found that they needed the other. So that's the basic story of the um, Ford and Kodak and other experiments. The funny thing is, and maybe this is a good place to stop. The funny thing is that when you change the structures, there's gonna be a lot of resistance and backlash, but the hearts and minds do ultimately follow because everybody's got friends and coworkers and they know that people are, that people's competence does not depend on their gender or background. So sooner or later, that awareness comes through. It has to get over the, idea that, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I was in a privileged background, for lack of a better word, and now I'm not. And I've got to get used to not having the same perks that I used to have or the same reassurance and security. But once you get through that, you realize that what you depend on people for has nothing to do with their background. If you don't realize that, you're out of touch with reality. It's not an accurate way of looking at the way the world works. Similarly, if you start with the hearts and minds, you come up against the structures of the organization, the incentives, the rules. And you wait until somebody comes into a position of authority where they can affect the rules. In some organizations, like a lot of governments, that's harder than in a corporation where the rules have to be more flexible by design. I think we, humanity, is at a point where we're ready to make those two types of changes in unison. And I think that's a lot of what's happening now. Beautiful. The chaos before the order, hopefully. The chaos from which the order emerges. It is a beautiful way to, to end. And I think we, we will, Art, if you're up for it, cover a bit more on Kodak and Ford, particularly Saul Alinsky, who was a a heretic we we can tip our hat to and i thought i'd refreeze our our session today with a quote that kind of encapsulates the concept of the ntl art said some of the ntl participants described the experiences as unconditional love others called it pure joy and others still as a kind of mystical breakthrough or what psychologist abraham maslow labeled as peak experience they returned at least for a moment to what Maslow described as the state of mind of a child free of fear and anxiety, spontaneous and simple, naturally open to personal growth and deeper understanding. In the final days of a tea group, people saw firsthand that the unconscious, whether it was their own or that of another person, was not a Freudian cesspool spewing forth bitter legacies of childhood traumas. It was a source of Pelagian grace and hidden value terrifying in its power yet delightful in its beauty it emerged naturally when people learned in the group's trusting empathetic environment how to talk and how to think openly and freely beautiful something that should remain with us throughout time in every organization and perhaps a good way to refreeze today's episode art this is a, it's exactly right and I think, I think the big way we've learned about unfreezing and uh, change and refreezing is that it's not a static process or a defined process. It's happening for all of us all the time. And uh, we learn we need to learn to manage the use so it doesn't add stress or take us out of our. Uh, comfort zone to go through it and with that i look forward Aiden, to talking to you next time nice one art thanks man i hope you're enjoying this extra content that we are producing thanks to our sponsorship by zai zai is a global financial services company specializing in foreign exchange and payments and supporting innovation in all its forms including this show please check them out on hellozai.com